overview talk of the book, um, in part for some students who may have read a piece of it, uh, and others who have read uh, other books that have been written in the field of the history of human rights. It's a broad project, uh, ambitious and superficial in parts, to try to assess the place of international human rights as a set of ideas and as a set of practices today to assess where they fit in human history and especially modern history as a whole. And today I want to pose the question how you might think about constructing such a historical inquiry, how you might place them in particular in a larger history of global cosmopolitanism, or as I'll insist in a bit, global cosmopolitanisms in the future. Now when one looks at the accumulated attempts to place human rights in history, you'll find a, a kind of common theme that human rights as today's cosmopolitanism or universalism must have involved some breakthrough to it in the past. And it was a singular breakthrough. Uh, cosmopolitanism, it, the discovery of it must have been a one-time only thing, or maybe sometimes in more complex accounts, it's still a single thing, but it's a kind of cumulative acquisition uh, in steps or stages over time. A great example of this you can find in one of the most famous scholarly books of the 20th century by a, a very famous classicist named Bruno Snell, who wrote a book called The Discovery of the Mind. And in it, he has a chapter called The Discovery of Humanity. Uh, <coughs> gives an interpretation of the Medea by Euripides. And he says, Euripides is the first to portray a human being who excites pity by the mere fact of being a human being in torment. As a barbarian, she has no rights, but as a human, she does. Now, I want to leave aside whether that's a good or bad reading of the Medea. What I want to note is the premise that there must have been someone, somewhere, who made the breakthrough, discovering humanity. Now, there are lots of other proposals you'll find for locating this singular breakthrough. Very frequently, uh, credits given to some uh, Greek and Roman philosophers called the Stoics. Other times, to Jesus, or some of his followers, who clearly did believe unity, uh, as Galatians tells us, of Greek and Jew, man and woman, and so forth. Other times, the clock is set forward uh, to the Renaissance, the most famous book on the Renaissance ever written by another German, this, uh, sorry, Swiss man, Swiss, uh, Jakob Burkhardt, posits that there was, in the Renaissance, a discovery of humanity. He admits that there had been an older concept of humanity. It's not Greek. Snell was wrong. It's Roman, but Burkhardt says it had just been logical up to that point. Just the logical notion that humans were all part of the same group without any moral unity. Uh, but it was in the Renaissance that this logical unity of humankind became a fact, and the rest, as you might say, uh, was history. Now, in my book, I tried to depart from a very different notion. It's pretty obvious, but this is pretty new, I think, in this particular field. I actually took it from a scholar of Sanskrit uh, named Sheldon Pollock, and his claim is very simple. There's more than one cosmopolitanism in history. Now, if that's right, uh, both at the level of, of visions of human unity or at practices that might flow from human unity, then the fact that some cosmopolitanism existed in the past is by itself, at least, no evidence that it's at all relevant to the later crafting or forging of our cosmopolitanism, uh, human rights, or the movement that's shaped around it. You could put it another way. The problem is not that universalism needed to be discovered at some point in this single breakthrough to humanity. But maybe the problem was that there were too many rival 
universalisms, almost from the start. Now again, this claim is very simple, but let me illustrate some of its potential power by alluding to some other major theorists in the humanity you will have heard of. One, Michel Foucault, who claims, uh, as I like to translate it, that humanity is an invention of recent date. If Sheldon Pollock is right, uh, not hardly. Instead, there have been visions of universal humanity and practices flowing from those various visions from a very early date. Or take Carl Schmitt, who in a famous statement uh, in my translation, says, whoever invokes humanity as the warrant for what he wants to propose in the world is lying. Uh, the suggestion is that if you invoke humanity as the reason for your policy or your action, you really want to do something quite specific, and we ought to press you to know what it is. Now, that might be a powerful, critical tool in thinking about invocations of the cosmopolis or the city in which all humans live. But from this point of view of comparative and competing cosmopolitanisms, the problem might not be that humanity is just a lie or a lure. It would be that there are multiple and distinctive jostling <coughs> and competing versions of the appeal to humanity. And we, we then might want to know what, what makes them specific in order to compare and contrast them and choose which one is most powerful. In that project, thinking that there's one humanity which has to be discovered at some point along the line is not going to be very helpful. And I don't think it's very helpful in thinking about where human rights, our cosmopolitanism or universalism today came from. Now actually, if we look back, I think Pollock's right that even if we take the Western tradition, there are lots of different moments when we can find grandiose, universalistic, or cosmopolitan visions of the unification or the reunification of humanity. Before there was a West or Western tradition in the canons that we teachers have constructed, uh, some people have argued that there was the most basic distinction between humans and their animals and their gods, which might, in things I've been teaching lately, like the Iliad, have been permeable distinctions, but they're still very real, and they probably originate from before recorded history. But in them exists some rough and ready notion of human unity. Or some people think that their later distinctions or later moments are more relevant. Uh, one very important distinction in human civilization is that between sedentary and nomadic groups. And it's been proposed that it's really the sedentary types who uh, invent something called human unity in order to cast people who are nomads on some <coughs> nether side of a, a border. Uh, barbarians lie outside that. Maybe most plausible or, or most relevant are these axial age visions. Axial age being the, the term coined by some philosophers and, and used now by sociologists to describe this remarkable fact that lots of new religions seem to be born uh, at a particular moment in human history, ones that still have considerable power in them, like Christianity and Buddhism. Whatever these different sources might look like, all of them seem equally universalistic, at least if we take that category to mean the breakthrough to some vision that unites humanity morally and claims some set of practical or even governmental consequences that follow from. So to look even later than that I've been speaking about so far. I don't want to deny that the Stoics were cosmopolitanisms, and it's true they invented the whole idea, cosmopolitanism coming from their notion of the cosmopolis. Similarly, Jesus' messianic vision seems about as universalistic as could be. But we can't infer from that any cosmopolitan tradition that would say 
in the vision of some contemporary liberal philosophers like Martha Nussbaum, link the Stoics with Kant and us in a chain. Now, uh, Pollock, uh, whom I mentioned, really uh, focuses on cross-cultural comparison. He's, as I mentioned, a Sanskrit scholar, and if you're at all interested uh, in that field, uh, his books are, are really exceptional. But he really tries to develop a kind of a longitudinal uh, comparison of cosmopolitanism, or cross-cultural, you might say. He looks at the Sanskrit cosmopolis, as he calls it, and the Latin <coughs> cosmopolis. But I think it's just as fruitful to apply his thinking about the rivalry and competition of cosmopolitanisms within what we commonly refer to as the Western civil, uh, civilization or tradition, noting differences amongst the various visions of human unity. Now, in doing this comparison, we can't ever focus just on shortfalls between cosmopolitan aspirations that a particular figure like a Stoic philosopher or Jesus might have, and the actual practices that result from those visions. <coughs> After all, if we just focused on this shortfall, we would have to be pretty critical of contemporary human rights movements, too, with their big <coughs> aspirations and their general irrelevance to outcomes in the world. Instead, it seems like this comparative project ought to be about comparing the aspirations themselves, the content of the cosmopolitan visions and doctrines, and how they differ, including in the this-worldly implications they want to have. So in, just to cite well-known examples, the Stoics and Jesus uh, may have well have been universalists, but uh, both were willing to tolerate practices we would find abhorrent, such as slavery. Uh, and of course, Christianity long down, down the line did so, suggesting that just to cite very basic facts, the content of these cosmopolitanisms is very different. In the Stoic case, there's a commitment to reform, it's true. But it's mainly a kind of personal internal reform involving uh, spiritual exercises. This is why Michel Foucault was so interested in them at the end of his life, through segregation of a select community from the world. The Christian breakthrough, at least in the beginning, doesn't seem to be about worldly reform, uh, but preparation for some big judgment coming imminently. And Paul if anything, more universalist than Jesus clearly thought something along these lines, too. If that's the case, the suggestion is we follow this uh, Pollock insight and try to look longitudinally across all the sources that people have proposed for our cosmopolitanism and be careful about what the, what the content of the vision is, and what practices uh, the vision is linked to. And we might find, we probably will find, such severe differences between them and contemporary ideas and practices as to make the idea of some breakthrough at one time, or even linear unfolding or cumulative acquisition, pretty suspect. And that's the argument I try to make uh, in just the first chapter of the book, which goes from the beginning of time to 1940. <laughs> now, I'm now going to turn to some modern issues to try to spin this analysis out a bit. Because I now want to argue that uh, this is going to be true even in modern times, uh, and even when terms and concepts seem to be pretty stable, since one can let me admit at the outset, trace the idea of rights pretty far back in Western history. And it seems as if at some point in modern times, and relatively early, whether the 17th or 18th century, there is some breakthrough to us. And I want to suggest that that might not be the right answer. So last, last way of stating this is to say 
let's drop the model of accumulation and instead look for revolutions within cosmopolitanism. Some versions <coughs> ousting others and making way for themselves. After all, what was the Cold War except a competition or rivalry of cosmopolitanisms? Somebody won, somebody lost, and presumably there were other versions that neither side would tolerate and could reappear. So I do want to acknowledge that rights, even the idea of natural rights, which is the immediate doctrinal predecessor of the rights of man of the revolutionary era, and perhaps our own human rights, exist a long time ago. Now, again, they're squabbling. When you have a one-time only breakthrough model, you find people start to squabble over who gets credit. And you find this squabbling reproduced within the literature about rights, with the debate uh, having various positions like the medieval breakthrough to rights, the 17th century breakthrough to rights, and so on. Most responsible people think that the 17th century was crucial, uh, at least as far as concerns natural rights, since it's hard to see the natural law traditions of scholasticism and later giving way without some big event to the natural rights doctrines of Thomas Hobbes and later figures. But when we look at those doctrines, we find that they're cosmopolitan. They're rooted in appeal to human nature or man as such. And yet, their practical consequence is the construction of the state and very soon the nation state. Now that's true already in Hobbes, where uh, the argumentative context of the first natural right is to lead us to agree <coughs> to the creation of a sovereign to protect that right, because there's only one at that point, the right to preserve oneself or to flee from the sovereign once he's created. Later, and really in continuity with the story, there may be a new sovereign in the form of the democratic people. But in the era of democratic revolution, if anything, the connection between the assertion of natural rights and the creation of sovereign states seems redoubled. Uh, in the American case, uh, the story is slightly different because what's wanted is liberation from empire or a post-colonial state. Whereas in the French case, the goal is the destruction of kings, their beheading eventually, and the creation of uh, a nation state on the ruins of the toppled thrones. But the tools in both cases were violence uh, and a revolution, if necessary. So this seems at the level, again, just of citing basic facts to be a very distinctive cosmopolitanism, both by comparison to earlier cosmopolitanisms, as well as by comparison to our own human rights, whose most significant practices seem to be lighting candles, sending checks in the mail, filing lawsuits, but never, to my knowledge, revolution. Even though the very polities of those who created the human rights movement were based on uh, that, that earlier cosmopolitanism. So I'm doing something that may be a bit uh, controversial, which is to insist that the rights of man not only aren't human rights, but in a sense are the opposite of human rights, that the rights of man of the American and French traditions would have to implode for human rights today, in particular with their allergy to <coughs> sovereignty as the outcome and tool of the assertion of the rights of man. Now, was there a rights of man movement one of my big concerns in the book is to try to figure out where the human rights movement as a practical grassroots endeavor came from. You might ask, 
was there a rights of man movement in the time of the assertion of natural rights or the rights of man of the American and French Revolution? It doesn't seem so unless we're willing to see nationalism as a movement. That seems to have been the major movement outcome of the assertion of the rights of man, especially in the 19th century. If we look to that century, the most emblematic partisan of the rights of man who sets the world on fire with his theories happens to be an Italian named Giuseppe Mazzini, who's ardently in love with the rights of man. The individual is sacred, he writes. He makes a flag for his rights of man movement, which was called Young Italy. And he puts liberty, equality, humanity on one side of it. And then on the other, he writes, unity, independence, i.e. for Italy. And uh, in case uh, uh, it weren't clear, he also uh, was willing to write terrorist manuals for this movement. So his practices, once he accepted the state as his aim, uh, seemed to be very different. You will have no name, token, voice, or rights, this is what he says to his fellow Italians. No admissions to the fellowship of peoples without a nation state. So the political translation of these rights of man as revolutionary nationalism, however liberal it was in the beginning, and Mazzini was certainly a liberal, uh, seems to be a major reason why the cosmopolitanism, uh, which we have to acknowledge in the revolutionary era, is so different from our own. And it's also a reason, I think, a major reason why there was a famous decline of appeal to natural rights and the rights of man in the 19th century. After all, in the late 18th century and the 19th century, there were these struggles for rights. But they were really struggles about the, uh, the creation of citizenship in the first instance, and then struggles uh, about the meaning of it. Who would get citizenship within the territory? Would blacks get it? Would women get it? What were its entitlements? Would social rights count? So you might say the assertion of the rights of man lead us into campaigns for concrete local citizenship. It's true that their warrant initially is humanity, but their outcome is our polity. And it shouldn't then be surprising that in a sense there's a kind of self-obsolescence to the rights of man. If the learning process is to build the state, the nation state, then the original warrant for doing so, once we get good at it, once we adopt the practices of citizenship <coughs> struggles, seem to make nature, or even the rights of man, less and less relevant. So I'm now going to invoke a local icon in my support, Hannah Arendt who says that the rights of man were treated as a sort of stepchild by 19th century political thought. No liberal or radical party in the 20th century even saw fit to include them in its program. If the laws of the country didn't live up to the demands of the rights of man, they were expected to change them by legislation or through revolutionary action. Citizenship, not lighting candles. So I want to take two main points from these reflections about this, this specific cosmopolitanism of the rights of man. It doesn't mean it's better. It's just different. First is that it's precarious. It's self-undermining. Uh, or at least that's what happened. The appeal to the rights of man, however naturalistic, leads back to concrete citizenship. And the rights of man no longer are necessary as a useless abstraction. But this argument about the rights of man also tells us how we could conceive of the rise of international human rights as a set of ideas and movement today. You might put it as follows. It can't be that the upsurge of human rights occurs just through a simple continuation 
of the rights of man. It had to happen in part through their collapse, especially insofar as sovereignty becomes not the tool, uh, but the enemy, at least in part. You could think about how do the rights of man differ, differ from contemporary human rights. I'm going to cite another theorist. I, I don't really agree with most, much of his work, but I'll cite this particular line, which seems to me quite powerful in getting us to compare the rights of man and human rights. This is another Italian, very different one, Giorgio Agamben. The very rights of man that once made sense as the presupposition of the rights of the citizen have been separated from and used outside the context of citizenship for the sake of the representation and protection of life that's driven to the margins of nation states or is far outside it. It's a very Orentian point, I think. Mm -hmm. Rights depend on citizenship space, whereas human rights don't seem interested in setting up something comparable and certainly not up to it. Rights, the suggestion is, were once the first prerogative of citizens, now they're the last chance of humans on this analysis. Now there's another very powerful way of thinking about the history of human rights, and I'm going to make a few notes about it as I turn to move to the end. It's from a book I know many of you have read if you're in Tom's class, Lynn Hunt's Inventing Human Rights. So let me say a few words about her model and some objections you might level against her. Her basic thesis, is, as, I, as I interpret it, is that the, there are humanitarian roots to human rights. That for some reason, the novel, perhaps other reasons, in the 18th century, there's an extraordinary upsurge of fellow feeling, pity, torrents of emotion, empathy, although that word is much more recent. And as a result, human rights are declared. First, the phrase circulates, they, they do what long. And she's shown that decisively, that natural rights are from the earlier period. Uh, it's after 1750 that something called the droit de starts rising in her sources. And then, of course, they're declared. Now, note, just as a minor complication, that there's no comparable development in English. Uh, so uh, you don't need that linguistic change in, in the American scene to have a revolution, and it could still be based on natural <coughs> rights. So it's unclear exactly what the real significance of this ling linguistic change was. Still, it happened, and it's around the same time as this explosion of pity for fellow man. Maybe they're linked. That's basically the thesis. <laughs> My, my worry about this thesis, which is extremely powerful, uh, is that it's under-inclusive on the one hand, and it's over-inclusive. Or you might put it by saying it explains too little on the one hand, and it explains too much on the other. So if you begin with the, the catalog of natural rights, and eventually the rights of man that we have, it's true that some norms were forged with the assistance of identifying with others' pain, like Bill Clinton told us to do, or at least that he did, feeling your pain, especially bodily pain. And it seems to me she may well be right about the rise of the norm, which we still find very important, against bodily invasion, especially torture, and might have had something to do with post-judicial punishment, uh, with the chastening of it, and maybe even rising allergies towards the practices of chattel slavery, which also, of course, involve the body. But that's just a few rights. Uh, and it's hard to see how we get from those to the full list or the larger concept. Uh, there are many other sources for rights, not least the most staunchly defended right across all modern history, which is the right to private property. And then there are others from the, probably mostly from the English common law involving the judicial process, excluding a cruel and unusual punishment, which don't, don't seem obviously to flow from some explosion of pity for fellow man. Which we look at humanitarianism in modern history, 
whether we look at abolitionism or so-called white slavery, a cause which follows abolition focused on traffic in women, uh, depredations against Christians and Jews, especially in the Ottoman Empire, a big cause in the later 19th century. These are all humanitarian causes. They're sparked by newspapers, proto-CNN, showing us suffering. But none of them were understood as rights campaigns, uh, at least to my knowledge, and certainly not in any dominant way. So what's, what's more striking is that humanitarianism and human rights rubrics remain separate. More important, uh, humanitarianism seems to have connections with lots of things. So now I'm suggesting that it's explaining, the thesis is explaining too much. It's most distinctively connected to imperial visions, explaining, given atrocity, why some empires deserve to be shut down, or at least their borders need to be moved back. Uh, much less distinctively with uh, the notion of the rights of man, which has its purchase, again, pri primarily at home in these citizenship contests, as if uh, it, it's not yet thinkable to attribute to suffering others the rights of man. So if all that's right, and one might add socialism, which also says it's out to save the wretched of the earth in the words of the socialist anthem, then we might want to keep humanitarianism and human rights more separate, not just in the 18th century, but across all of modern history. It's clear, it's clear that today they're much more jumbled up than they were then, uh, but uh, that wasn't really true all along. Now, if we're going to continue this story, and I'm going to stop soon, I'm only giving you some basic building blocks of the argument through the first chapter or so, we would have to think about the rise of internationalism, which might be the distinctive modern cosmopolitanism, but it's one that's not available at the time of the French Revolution. Uh, the global space somehow hasn't yet been reconfigured to allow the word of international. Bentham, it's true, coins it around the time of the French Revolution in the early 19th century. But most historians who have done the work show that the notion of an international space where there might be a forum to regulate the world above and beyond nations really doesn't come into view, uh, certainly from an organizational perspective, until after 1850. And here's the striking thing. There are all sorts of internationalism after 1850, mainly due to the transformation of global space involving the transformation of capitalism. But internationalism never implied, almost never, except for a few Marxists, the abolition of the nation state. And often, as in the Olympics, it, it mainly provided a grander stage for the self-expression of these pre-existing nation states. And it also served everyone. There was aristocratic internationalism, families across borders, you might call it, uh, or royalty across borders, postal internationalism, various kinds of regulatory regimes that begin to come about, weights and measures, language for some dreamers uh, in this precise era. But there's no rights proposals. There's no proposals that rights, the rights of man, transcend nations for decades until possibly the middle of the 20th century. Take a, a citizenship cause like the women's movement. It does take international form very pioneeringly in these years, but it's primarily at that point in order to share techniques and build associational self-confidence for agitation at home, especially around suffrage. It's not that the global forum will itself become a place where we would invent or reform. We would use it, in a sense, to meet together before returning to our main event, the citizenship struggle. And of course, then there's international socialism, which, as I mentioned, did uh, envisage 
the abolition of the nation state, did appeal to pity and sympathy for suffering workers. <coughs> but of course, due to Marx's critique of rights, didn't propose to form an international human rights movement. So if all that I've been saying is right, or partly right, then we would want to look very carefully at the 20th century with our eye cast on continuity, looking at the rights of man and internationalism alike, which were at first unconnected, and asking how did their old forms go away, and how did some new forms come about in which they could connect in our time, leaving behind earlier features and taking on new ones. Well, maybe I'll end. I should probably talk for five-ish more minutes. It's not 7.40. Uh, by proposing the following thesis. Typically, the moment of breakthrough when finally human rights are invented, uh, when they're not attributed to the Jews, the Greeks, the French Revolution, is the 1940s. And of course, I'm very far from denying the importance of this era. In particular, it's in English uh, in the 40s that human rights is basically coined. You can find marginal earlier uses of the phrase human rights before 1942, January. Uh, but not really. Uh, one of the pages in my book has a chart of just the uses of the phrase human rights in Anglo-American newspapers. Um, and essentially there's a flat line prior to 1940. And then there's a tiny blip. And the rest of the book is really devoted to looking at this major spike. Uh, this is, I mean, you can't see it, but you, that there's this spike. flat line, minor blip, major spike, and it's in 1977. And so my proposal is that we look where the spike is. And that's what much of the book is about. But let me close by talking about decolonization as a, as a good candidate for our attention. Generally left out of all of the materials in the emerging history of human rights. What, why might decolonization have been so crucial in ways that have been neglected? Well, my suggestion is that it's, it's the real candidate for thinking about why sovereignty came to seem insufficient to Westerners as the forum and the tool for rights. Now, this wasn't true at the start, and it certainly wasn't true for the decolonizers themselves. In the terms I've been developing today, you might say, very briefly, that decolonization was the last rights of man movement in history. After all, it was the agent of the greatest dissemination of sovereignty <coughs> in world history. And so it was the last, and for some reason, the last gasp of the rights of man. And if you look, actually, you'll find in comparing constitutions, that there are lots of new constitutions that may not have been honored in every particular, but they were formulated in the French tradition most often, sometimes incorporated, incorporating newer models like the Weimar Constitution, sometimes even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. But again, their purpose was the constitution of sovereignty, just as it had been in constitutionalism all along in modern history. Why, were, why, were, why was this moment the last gasp? It's not surprising that maybe that it would be the last gasp for sovereignty. After all, where else could it go? There are some secessionist movements, uh, later the Kosovars, for example. Uh, and then there are a few islands that are still under something like colonial rule, like Puerto Rico, various islands. In. But we, we, would, we might posit that it, it, it loses its, its interest as a tool because the job's done. 
But why an international human rights movement that doesn't appear not only in the 1790s, but even in the 1940s? The rights are announced, universal, if people meant these to be international, above the state, legalized, nothing happened. They weren't legalized, no human rights movement. Why did it happen in the later 60s and 70s? Well, my suggestion is the rise of the view that for some reason, for some, in some unprecedented way, sovereignty failed now to entail individual rights as plausibly as it had before. When we, North Atlantic Democrats, had founded our nations, just as Hannah Arendt insisted, pay attention to foundings, not rights, we had created spaces of individual protection along the way. But our fellows around the world <coughs> came to say, didn't, maybe couldn't, why not, who knows. They didn't. They failed to do so. The concept failed them. They failed the concept. Whatever. In any case, the, the new view is that the tool is, is spent. And not only has it run out of steam, but it's failed. And something new is needed. Remarkably, no comparable widespread insight after the Holocaust, to which human rights weren't a response. Instead, the world, world order takes shape again, as a collection of sovereign nations, even one based on a concert of great power, which is what the UN was and perhaps still is. After decolonization, however, the state seems much more troubling than ever before in a widespread way. One of my favorite quotations from the book is from Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., a famous liberal historian, American historian, confidant of John F. Kennedy, and so forth, who died a few years ago. In 1977, which is the year of that terrific spike, he says the following, states may meet all the criteria of national self-determination and still be blots on the planet. Human rights is the way of reaching the deeper principle, which is individual self-determination. Put it differently, rights had once been advanced through the rights of man movement of national self-determination. Now rights need to be excised from that project and pursued some other way, above the state, beyond the state, chastening the sovereign nation state. So you might put the argument like this. The project <coughs> of individual protection without collective emancipation, since they've always been linked together in modern history, the project of pursuing the one without the other was the tombstone of the rights of man and the birth certificate of human rights, which is why they're a new cosmopolitanism, very different, not just from that of the Jews, Christians, early moderns, French revolutionaries, but pretty much everyone until our time. So that's what I have.